When I was little, I remember flipping through TV channels late one Saturday night, and after mindlessly scrolling for a bit, I stumbled upon the image of a girl in a hospital bed who was very, very burnt, being raised by barbed wire. The barbed wire wrapping around a woman, ending with her being torn apart, while the wire then attacked a building full of people. It was gruesome, it was graphic and wild, and I fell in love with this movie in that moment. Years later, I would learn that that movie was called Silent Hill, and it was based off a video game of the same name. It wouldn't be till about 12 years later I'd finally get to play and watch my partner play the game Silent Hill itself, and out of curiosity, we decided to watch the movie afterwards. And with a very heavy heart, I have to say, the movie Silent Hill is still really good. Now, before you all roast me like a supposed witch on a steak, I think I need to clarify what exactly I'm saying when I say it's still really good. Am I saying that the Silent Hill movie is an impeccable adaptation of the game? Absolutely, 100% not even. <laughs> it's very far from that actually, which we will discuss in this video. What I'm saying is that the movie Silent Hill channels the same main beats, theme, and feel of the original iconic game. And that because of all that, it's actually a pretty good reimagination of the first Silent Hill game. And I am allowed to think that because for every single good movie that I like, I'm allowed to like one bad one in return. It just so happens that the one I like in this case is a video game adaptation off an iconic video game, so here we are. So in order to discuss why I think that Silent Hill is a good movie, we obviously need to discuss the game and the movie's whole storyline and all that. So why not start there? And hell, why not start off with the iconic game itself? At its core, the game Silent Hill is about a man named Harry Mason looking for his adopted daughter Cheryl in what seems to be an empty town after a car accident on their way to go on vacation, the accident being caused by Harry swerving his car to avoid hitting a girl. On his journey to find his daughter, and as he meets people throughout who seem incredibly misplaced amongst what Harry has now come to recognize as an eerie, almost unreal town, he discovers the dark secrets and dark history of Silent Hill, which all relate to his daughter Cheryl, a girl named Alessa, Alessa's mother Dahlia, and a cult and a ritual. In the movie, however, it's a bit different. Rose De Silva, who, against her husband Christopher's wishes, takes her daughter Sharon, who's been having consistent sleepwalking stunts and nightmares about Silent Hill, to Silent Hill but in the process of that, crashes her car due to a girl stepping out in front of them. This sends Rose and Sharon into a foggy, unreal version of Silent Hill, and Rose on a quest to find Sharon, who went missing after the crash, and also to learn about the dark secrets and history of the town surrounding the Brethren cult and a fire that broke out during the witch-burning ritual. Basically, it's almost the same thing apart from the protagonist's gender changing, the name of the daughter, why they're driving in the first place, who's all involved and what's happened to them, the cult's main objective, who's the main antagonist, as well as the ending. Yeah, so there's some pretty big differences between the game and the movie. But to be upfront, a lot of those don't necessarily feel like the biggest differences when you look at the big picture. The switch of the protagonist going from being a man to being a woman really doesn't change a lot because Harry and Rose's core trait is that they're willing to do anything possible to get their daughter back and to save the one they love. The name change of Cheryl to Sharon is really insignificant considering that is truly the only difference between Cheryl and Sharon in the game compared to the movie. Them being the other half of Alessa is still consistent. So other than just a weird and unnecessary change, it is insignificant. The reason they're driving is, well, also insignificant to say the least. The only real downside to it is that it gives us Sharon screaming her lungs out about Silent Hill in the beginning of the movie, which is more comical to me than actually meaningful. The movie differs greatly from the game with the inclusion and omission of certain characters, though. First of all, there's the whole Chris plot within the movie, which is basically where you see what's going on while Rose is in the Unreal Fog version of Silent Hill, which basically is just Sean Bean running around and occasionally getting a little whiff or sense of Rose as she runs around in the same area, but in the fog world. <sighs> It provides backstory and lets you know that Officer Gucci, yes, that is this man's name, was the cop Dahlia got help from to try to save Alessa and how he was there that day and knows what went down in the town and basically he's just there to give us more scenes with Sean Bean. Is it unnecessary? Yeah, it really is, but I mean, it's Sean Bean, so I'll cope. Sybil is in both, however, instead of her fate being left up to the player as it is in the game, her fate is sealed to be burned to death as a witch by the Brethren cult after making sure Rose would be able to look for Lessa to find Sharon and find out what the hell is going on in that town overall. 
find her. <laughs> Seriously though, her sacrifice is actually pretty badass. Her taking on those dudes is queen shit. However, main characters such as Lisa Garland and Michael Kaufman are nowhere to be found and are excluded from the movie despite having some pretty obvious importance in the game. Lisa and Kaufman being characters intertwined within each other's plots due to Lisa's addiction to PTV being fueled by Kaufman due to her being given this drug to help cope with taking care of Alessa and all her crispy goodness in the basement ward, and Kaufman in general manufacturing the drug which is used in the game to control disciples of the cult, connecting him to the cult in the game as well. In the grand scheme of things, especially in comparison to the movie's version of the cult, this exclusion sucks because they're genuinely interesting characters, but I don't really see where they'd fit in the movie with all that being said. Well, unless you consider the nurse in Alessa's hospital room to be Lisa, but that's genuinely a reach. Speaking of the cult, this also differs greatly from the game to the movie in very obvious ways. In the game, the cult is really defined by Dahlia, Alessa's mother, because she's the catalyst for everything in the game occurring. Dahlia conducts a ritual to force Alessa to birth the cult's deity. Alessa gets burnt badly from this ritual, but can't die due to her being a vessel for the deity, while also not being able to give birth to said deity due to mental resistance to said ritual, and therefore her soul splitting in half and creating Cheryl. Cheryl wanting to go to Silent Hill due to Dahlia casting a spell on her to lure her back and foil Alessa's plan, making Cheryl and Alessa rejoin souls and the deity possessing her. Basically, this bitch is the whole cult plot. The movie, on the other hand, is way, way simpler than that with their cult stuff. The cult, called the Brethren in the movie, is not trying to birth a deity or anything. They're simply an evil cult led by a woman named Christabella that seeks to purify people, including Alessa, who is a child stigmatized for being born out of wedlock, who was also raped by the school janitor. And they do this through burning her alive in a ritual. How quaint. The ritual goes awry, Alessa gets hospitalized, and her soul splits due to her rage. The good part of her being Sharon, who's brought to the real world, and the dark part being what's making Silent Hill go all funky and trapping the people who hurt her in their darkest dream. dream. It's definitely a big change motivation-wise, and it's one that I definitely understand people not liking, though I don't think the movie could have really went with the birth of a deity route even if they wanted to due to these changes, and I'd argue additions to the theme and meaning of the movie. But I'm getting ahead of myself with that statement. Then there's, as I briefly mentioned in the last part, the antagonists in the game and movie differing greatly as well. In the game, Alessa's mother Dahlia, who really is the entirety of the cult's representation in the game, is the antagonist due to her abusing and forcing her daughter to birth her cult's deity. She's the catalyst for all the bad things, basically, thus making her the antagonist of the game. However, in the movie, the cult named the Brethren cult's leader isn't Dahlia, it's a woman named Christabella. Christabella is the woman who convinces Dahlia to allow the cult to purify Alessa for her being born out of wedlock and for being raped by the janitor. This purification being Alessa being emulated, and unfortunately Dahlia is unable to save her daughter despite attempting to after realizing what she's done. It's a big change from the game, we've gone from the mother being the unquestionable bad guy to the mother having a Logan Paul moment. I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. But as previously said with the differing objective of the cult, it makes sense due to the changes and arguably addition to the theme and meaning behind the movie in comparison to those within the game. Lastly, there is a very very obvious difference in the endings between the game and the movie. The game offers five endings, those being bad, bad plus, good, good plus, and the very clearly true ending, the joke ending. The endings being determined by the player's actions in the game and how they decide to handle certain situations. Whereas the movie offers, well, honestly, quite a weird ending that really isn't comparable to any of the endings in the game. The ending of the Silent Hill movie has Rose and Sharon leaving Silent Hill after the bloodbath caused by the dark part of Alessa, but also not really leaving Silent Hill due to the fog still being there and the clear depiction of them not being back in the real world through them coming home, but Sean being not being able to see them despite the door now being open. Look, I can defend a lot of things about this movie and talk about how insignificant some changes are and how some of them are actually pretty good, but um, we gotta admit that this ending's stupid. Overall, the plots for both the movie and the game are relatively similar on a very surface level. They're about a parent looking for their child in an abandoned town while uncovering the horrible secrets about the people of said town. But the differences are most definitely there as well. Again, everything I listed is a very noticeable difference to those who have played the game. However, I feel that the majority of these differences between the game and the movie are either incredibly insignificant, such as a simple name change or a switch in the protagonist 
protagonist's gender or something that makes sense due to other changes made. The only one that I truly find to be unnecessary and bullshit is just the change in the ending. I can't even justify that weird move through anything except wanting a sequel. Basically, is it a spot-on, shot-for-shot adaptation? No, absolutely not, and it's understandable why fans of the game wouldn't like that. The Silent Hill movie removes characters from the game that were significant, the cult's motives are different, and in general, the main antagonists are different. The game Silent Hill is an iconic hit, and through taking these elements away from the beloved story, of course you're gonna upset people. However, a majority of those changes, while again, are understandable for fans to be upset about, feel fitting and necessary to be made in order to tell the story that that writer and director Christoph Gaines is telling in regards to Silent Hill. It takes elements such as characters and the overall idea of trying to find your daughter in this weird town and does what it wants with it to create a new story, one that is arguably as impactful as the original one its characters and main idea are taken from. In that sense, I feel the Silent Hill movie did primarily a really good job and those changes from the game to the movie actually make it good despite the main grievance and biggest criticism being the ending. Now, with me mentioning theme and meaning for what feels like to be the millionth time, I'm sure, I think it's time we talk about the similarities and differences between the theme and meaning for both the Silent Hill movie and the Silent Hill game, and kind of just address why, despite there being differences, I actually really don't mind them. Because arguably, as I previously discussed, the change in the cult's objective as well as the main antagonist kind of has a lot to do with this, and it's change I kind of welcome with open arms. As much as the first game is nowhere near the levels of being a big ol' psychological game like the second one is, the theme of the game Silent Hill seems to align more with the dark parts of people as well as corruption. We see the dark parts of people specifically through Dahlia and Alessa's relationship, Dahlia being very clearly abusive to Alessa through how she demonizes her daughter and through obviously forcing her to be the host for her cult's deity. The theme of corruption, however, is equally spread out throughout the game through every character except Sybil, Harry, and Cheryl. Lisa Garland is corrupted through Michael Kaufman feeding her addiction to PTV to keep her compliant and working to keep Alessa alive. Kaufman in general is corrupted through being an associate of Dahlia and his dealing of PTV and Dolly is obviously corrupted through her religion and how it leads her to the extreme of performing a ritual on her own daughter. The themes in the movie are rather similar, but also rather different, giving those changes to the cult's motive and the antagonist of the game. The dark parts of people in the Silent Hill movie is seen through multiple people, such as the janitor who rapes Alessa, Christabella who harms people in the name of purifying them, as well as the brethren cult overall going out of their way to accuse everyone they don't like or who are seemingly different than them of being witches and blindly following Christabella's teachings. Corruption within the Silent Hill movie is also seen through Christabella and the brethren cult. Christabella has essentially corrupted this entire town into believing in the purifying of people through ritualistically burning them, going as far as to convince Dahlia into following through with this after Alessa's assault. And the Brethren Cult congregation are corrupted through Christabella's command, as well as their blind belief in their religion, as we see with Anna going out of her way to try to harm Dahlia several times, and the other cult members quickly jumping to witch accusations seemingly any chance they get. However, the Silent Hill movie also brings forth a new theme of motherhood through their little switch to Rose bringing Sharon to Silent Hill instead of the husband, which is reflected through the mirroring of Rose to Dahlia, which, in my opinion, genuinely adds more meaning to this movie. Rose and Dahlia are mirrored images of each other in the film. They're both mothers who very clearly love their children. One of them just makes the choice to put their trust in a cult leader to help essentially make her daughter normal amongst her peers, unknowingly throwing her to the wolves and obviously regretting it. This regret is even shown through Dahlia trying to protect Sharon from the Brethren cult, going head to head with members that could definitely take her out, as well as using herself as a shield to keep them from grabbing Sharon. Seriously, they gave Dahlia a real sympathetic redemption arc through this, and it's just such a welcome change from the horrible fucking mother that is Dahlia in the game. While on the other hand, you have Rose, who from the start fights tooth and nail to find and save her daughter from this cult that's taken to deeming her daughter to be impure due to her having the likeness of Alessa. Now with the theme of good old motherhood being said, I think it's time we actually talk about the meaning behind the movie and the game, and more so actually how I find there to be more meaning in the Silent Hill movie than actually in the Silent Hill game. Which is not a bad thing by any means, put down your pitchforks, you don't need them quite yet. <laughs> it's just a notable difference to me that adds more meaning to the movie. So first and foremost, 
Per the article looking at the big picture, adapting film theory to examine map form, meaning, and aesthetic, explicit meaning is the core ideological point of a film that is typically quite clearly presented and points to the moral or global ideology being promoted. In the movie Silent Hill, the explicit meaning is very clearly seen through the two mothers in the film, and simply being that mother is God in the eyes of a child. I mean, you can't get any more explicit. They say that word for word in the movie not once. Mother is God in the eyes of a child. But twice, mother is God in the eyes of a child. This meaning is solely possible through the decision to not have Chris bring Sharon to Silent Hill, but instead have Rose do it, as well as the decision to have Chris Bella be the antagonist instead of Dahlia. And of course, this comparison of Dahlia to Rose is tied into the meaning as well. In regards to substituting Rose for Chris, if they didn't want to focus on mothers and the bond between mothers and their children, they could have just as easily kept Chris as the main protagonist and the one to bring Sharon to Silent Hill. Hell, they could have left out Rose entirely and went beat per beat with the game if this is the route they wanted to take. Which leads me to thinking that this change was clearly intentional to push this meaning. It's also the same way with Christabella becoming the antagonist instead of Dahlia. They absolutely could have kept Dahlia as the big bad in the movie. They could have even worked that into fitting with the meaning of Mother being God in the eyes of a child to show a more harsh comparison between her and Rose. However, this switch in antagonists makes it so Dahlia can, as previously stated, mirror Rose and show Dahlia's devotion to her daughter and how her love for her daughter was as real as Rose's is for Sharon. She just made a fatal mistake in trusting someone else to help her daughter in her time of need. Now I want to talk about the feel that I get from the Silent Hill movie and how it tries as hard as it can to encapsulate the same feeling that the game brings to the players without obviously being a video game. Which, as we all know by now, is one of the hardest things for video game adaptations to actually really nail, and I truly think that the Silent Hill movie does this to the best of its ability, despite the fact that there are quite a few misses within that. So to make this progress a little bit more smoothly, we're going to be separating this into pros and cons, because truly, this is the easiest way I can think of doing it and just kind of putting my thoughts out there. Seriously prepare yourselves. Starting with the pros, I really want to talk about the monsters, specifically the nurses and Colin. When I tell you that the nurses and Colin are like standout monsters in this movie, I genuinely mean it with every inch of my heart and soul. Yes, neither of them are part of the Silent Hill game, either by inclusion or by design. However, they are the most standout monsters in this film for the simple fact that they feel the most Silent Hill out of all of the monsters in the movie. The nurses are exactly what you would expect from the nurses in the second Silent Hill game. They move in convulsing and jolty motions, making them feel inhuman, and the sounds coming from them? Mark me down as scared and horny. They are so well done, and it was accomplished by having dancers portraying them, showing truly that practical monsters can absolutely be done right for a Silent Hill movie. Colin is also a standout monster because, first of all, this dude's fucking creepy. Not only for what he did to Alessa, but with how mangled his body is left, and even better, how he moves said mangled body throughout the nightmare Silent Hill and corrupts it with his touch. Ugh, it's so cool. Colin is acted out by Roberto Campanella, so this is yet another monster done practically that just absolutely works. Also, I'd be remiss to not talk about the sounds he makes too, because truly... <laughs> That sells me on him being creepy. Creepy and like death and nightmare form, he checks all the boxes for being a spooky monster and adding to what makes this movie as great as it is. With the discussion of actors and dancers playing characters, I really want to point out how good of a job I think Jodel Ferlin does at playing both Sharon and Alessa because I really think she deserves her flowers on this. Sharon and Alessa are two very, very different characters in this movie, and Jodel is able to make both of them distinct from one another without being super cartoony. All we ask for is satisfaction. Satisfaction? Revenge. Except occasionally. Look, it's better than some of the adults acting, so I'm gonna give her credit for this, okay? She makes Sharon and past pretty well done over a charcoal grill, Alessa, so similar, which works given that Sharon is arguably that half of her. And she makes what's left of Alessa this eerie figure that can honestly be rather creepy at times and just a fun form of evil for a movie. <laughs> 
Seriously, how can you not love this bit? To get even more human with the pros, when talking about the feel of the movie compared to the game, it's absolutely imperative for us to discuss the music for the movie because it is by far the best 10 out of 10 5 star part of the overall feel of this movie. When you think about the original Silent Hill game, it's not hard to remember how creepy everything is due to the music, how industrial and grimy other world of Silent Hill is, and how ominous and anxiety inducing the foggy town is. The music in the movie, however, it's so good and eerie and fitting in the movie, it really just captures the same vibe as the original. And that's simply because the musical score was arranged by Jeff Dana using the original music from Silent Hill 1 through 4, which are all composed by Akira Yamaoka. So needless to say, they really took the easiest and also probably the smartest route with this. Because truly, if it ain't broke, why fix it? They really blended music from the first four games extremely well into this movie. My personal favorites being the use of Dance with the Night Wind from Silent Hill 3 on the walk to the hospital. As well as the Last Boss remix, also from Silent Hill 3, being used during the beginning of Alessa's Revenge. I can't lie, while it's definitely an easy route to use the music from the games themselves, it's rather spectacular how they're able to make the music from the games work with the movie, and honestly, it is such a treat that they were able to do that. It really does attest to how timeless the music from the Silent Hill games are. Yes, even the corn song from Silent Hill Downpour, that shit is a banger and I will not tolerate any corn slander. <laughs> Aside from actors and more human portions of the movie in every regard, the Silent Hill movie brought something new and that I personally enjoyed at the table, which is the dissolve of reality to bring forth the other world. There's just something about reality dissolving and deteriorating right before a character's eyes that just really hits hard and I think falls perfectly in line with the theme of corruption. The siren goes off and things slowly but surely start to dissolve into this hellish area unlike what was there before, even progressing further by a corrupted ghoul of a character touching it. It's so sick, dude. Now to get into the cons, since we're on the subject of the world dissolving into the other world, I have to admit I truly admire their ambition for trying to recreate scenes of the other world in this movie but they really, really don't translate all that well from the game to the movie. The most notable one I can point to talk about with this is the little courtyard maze from the beginning of the game during the first shift in Worlds. The game's courtyard has this grime and darkness that aptly shows a ripped apart and strewn up body with like wire and it gives you this claustrophobic disorientated feel and you just get creeped out and the movie tries to do that. They just can't capture that same feeling. The most that the film does is add to the creep factor with the view from the still living man that's strung up, but that doesn't make up for the overall lack of grime that the other areas in this movie have in comparison to the game. The movie feels like it has more of a sanitized grime, while the game has more of an abandoned building in the middle of nowhere that you probably shouldn't go into, but you did, and now you're regretting it kind of grime. Now, in line with the grime factor, and I know I listed this kind of as a pro, but I mentioned specifically the nurses and Colin, I kind of want to get into how the monsters just really aren't it. Meaning everything except the nurses and Colin, which includes my boy Pyramid Head. When I tell you that the monsters other than the nurses and Colin are a letdown, I genuinely mean that they are a massive letdown predominantly because of CGI. Because very fun fact that I was shocked to learn about when I was looking further into this, majority of the monsters are actually filmed in a practical manner. The Armless Man? He's a dancer, and to be honest, I couldn't find anything talking about CGI involving this monster, so maybe it's just a blending issue, but I personally feel like the armless man looks fake, like it doesn't look like a real thing coming at them. Which it is, and the movements are perfect due to the dancer doing a phenomenal job, and the costume looks so good in behind the scenes footage, so I don't know if like color grading or some kind of other thing that went on had an effect on it looking different, but it just doesn't look that good. The Grey Children? Also a dancer, one with several shots superimposed to tackle some scenes. And also CGI burning effects, which are what make it, in my opinion, not all that good looking to be honest. Paired with the off looking superimposing, that specific scene's kind of weird to be honest. 
CGI in general also isn't the best in this. I mean, with Sybil's burning, I'm gonna go off on a limb here and assume it's CGI because I saw no behind the scenes of it, but it's only sold through Lori Holden's acting being as visceral as it is. The creeper is oh, running around in the zoom out of the school bathroom and while being chased around the other world school looked out of place to be honest. They also don't give the same vibe as the version in the game, and that's probably because Christopher Gans changed the symbolism of them to be the memories of people killed by Alyssa, which is unnecessary because they're bugs. They work well on their own, but I digress. I just feel like the CGI didn't hold up against the test of time well in general for this film, and also that the color of scenes didn't really do majority of the monsters justice. Again, nothing against the dancers playing these monsters. They did a phenomenal job. They just got done very dirty by CGI and what I can only assume to be color grading issues. Pyramid Head, however, he's a completely and utterly different ball game. Pyramid Head is played spectacularly in this by the same man who played Colin. My only critique is his inclusion in general due to what he symbolizes in Silent Hill 2 and him being ripped straight from Silent Hill 2. Much like the nurses, Pyramid Head is very clearly ripped from the second game, which makes genuinely no sense here because he's very openly a manifestation of James Sunderland's guilt and desire for punishment. He's a constant reminder of how he killed Mary, so I can really only assume that the reason that Pyramid Head was included in the movie is because he's just become iconic to the franchise, and how could they not have him? I mean, in the depth of my delusion, I could pretend he's a protective father figure that Alessa never had, given that no one knows who the father is and he's clearly not in the picture. But I genuinely think that would be giving the movie way more credit than it deserves, as if I have been doing this this whole video already, but I guess this is where I draw the line. Lastly, the final con I want to talk about for the movie Silent Hill is one brought to the front of my mind due to a quote from the executive producer, Andrew Mason. In Silent Hill the game, the creators put you constantly in an environment in which everything is potentially threatening and nothing feels like it will ever offer you comfort. This film seeks to reproduce that experience for a wider audience. And because of that quote, I have to say that the film really didn't reproduce the threatening environment where nothing feels like it will ever offer you comfort, as well as the film that inspired the game Silent Hill did. In an interview by Jay Taylor, Kichiro Toyama, the director, writer, and background designer of the game Silent Hill, stated that for the nightmarish theme of Silent Hill, you can find influence from the 1990 film Jacob's Ladder. And my god, it definitely shows. Without getting into too heavy of spoilers, Jacob's Ladder is a movie about Jacob Singer, an infantryman whose time prior to and in Vietnam have given him these weird visions and disturbing hallucinations that plague his life daily, getting worse and worse throughout the film as he tries to uncover why all of this is happening to him. The film blurs the line between reality and hallucinations frequently, reinforcing this paranoia and fear that Jacob feels even from the most normal occurrences and people. It truly leaves you on edge while watching it and wondering what the hell is going on. It captures the exact feelings that the Silent Hill game does as well, and unfortunately it makes more of a Silent Hill movie than the actual Silent Hill movie. I haven't spoiled anything from the film, trust me, the hallucinations and paranoia aspect are just barely scratching the surface of that movie. So I highly recommend that if you don't like the Silent Hill movie, you should definitely check out Jacob's Ladder. Basically, it does everything that the Silent Hill movie does wrong, absolutely right. Overall, there's a lot of good things that I think the Silent Hill movie did upon a quick little vibe check, but there's also a lot of things I sincerely think the movie didn't do that well or has been done better by another film that inspired the Silent Hill game. Because as much as I love this movie, I am not that delusional to think that it is void of any criticism. I can just accept the criticisms as what they are and continue watching the movie over and over again and even find it enjoyable and good for funsies. Now lastly, I want to talk about why I consider the Silent Hill movie to be more so a reimagination of the Silent Hill game more than a based on the game, completely one-on-one -on -one accurate kind of thing. Because let's face it, that's what it gets a lot of criticism for. And I especially want to talk about how that idea really isn't far-fetched, considering a game that would later come out in the Silent Hill franchise. At least in my delusion-filled brain. Throughout this video, I've discussed the differences and similarities between the game Silent Hill and the movie Silent Hill. From character changes to overall plot points, added meaning, and even the worst, the change in the ending. I've talked about the themes behind both the game and the movie, as well as the meaning that's really driven home in the movie. Mother is God in the eyes of a child. I've even given you an itemized list of my pros and cons to this movie with comparisons to the game, but obviously more with my opinion at the center of it all. And with that all being said, I need to direct you guys to the definition of the word reimagination 
because truly everything I've stated fits so well in that box. According to Kirk from We Are Movie Geeks, breakdown of the Wikipedia definition, a film is reimagined if the director or screenwriter on a film goes back to the source material and makes their film based off that work, which for this situation would be based off the source material that is the game Silent Hill. Box also has an article discussing what a reimagining is, describing it as similar to a remake, but with something being added or changed from the original that alters it in a major way. With these two definitions in mind, and especially if you're familiar to the franchise, you definitely know where I'm going with this. The Silent Hill movie, due to all of its changes, yet still being based off the same rough beats and plot of the game, is more so of a reimagining than a movie that's meant to be a scene-per-scene -scene adaptation of the original Silent Hill game. Or that's at least what I'll tell myself to justify liking all these changes. And honestly, all that is okay with me because this would not be the first time that we see this occur in the Silent Hill franchise. Silent Hill Shattered Memories is a game that came out in 2009, three years after the movie came out, that is a reimagination of the first game that really just holds on to the point of Harry looking for his missing daughter Cheryl, and that's actually about the only thing, other than characters' names, that the game has in common with the first game. The game removes the cult aspect from the first game, completely changes the ending by opting for an M. Night Shyamalan move, and arguably changes a lot more from the game it's based on than the Silent Hill movie does. But it's still good, I've thoroughly enjoyed watching gameplay and playthroughs of it since I can't get my grabbers on it right now, and even review scores are relatively positive. With that being said, I think that really attests to the fact that reimagined versions of the original Silent Hill can be good when they are explicitly that. Hell, they can even be liked while it being explicitly reimagined versions of the iconic original Silent Hill game. And I think that due to the definition of reimagining, as well as how arguably the Silent Hill movie didn't change nearly as much as Silent Hill Shattered Memories did, it should be considered a good reimagination of the original Silent Hill game and embraced as something similar to Shattered Memories, more so than seen as a failed shot-for-shot -shot adaptation of the game. The Silent Hill movie has a lot of great features to it, from the practical monsters and great music integration to the major changes such as an interesting switch to discuss motherhood more heavily by switching protagonists and antagonists around. And I feel like those things have at least earned the movie a consideration of being a reimagination over a bad adaptation. Because truly, when you look at the big picture, it's really no different than Silent Hill Shattered Memories, and I think this little status or title switch to reimagination gives the movie the acknowledgement it deserves for its changes while also honoring the original game by not trying to say, hey, here's a game in movie form. Hi. So, uh, I know that I said that that last part was going to be the last part, but I have one more thing that I really want to add to this conversation. Is it personal? Of course it is. However, hasn't this whole video been personal considering I'm defending a movie that I genuinely really like? So I think you can bear with me for one more teeny tiny personal point. As I said at the beginning of this video, the movie Silent Hill was my original introduction to the game. I stumbled upon the movie, looked into it, found out it was a game part of a massive series of games, and truly upon making this, I've realized that I have this movie to thank for getting me into horror games. Wild, I know, right? Horror games were not a staple in my household at all. I was obviously very young when the big three Silent Hill games came out, and my dad, the primary player of the PlayStation 2 till I felt comfortable to play by myself, was way more into shooting games and most definitely James Bond games. Horror really only existed in my life at this point through horror movies. And truly, looking a little bit further into this random horror movie I saw on TV led me head first into a world I never would have even known of. My knowledge of horror games prior to this was rather limited. I'd argue anything outside of PewDiePie screaming over Slenderman was rather foreign to me for some time. And while I've only recently been able to play the Silent Hill games the correct way, <clears throat> not using the Truly Nightmarish remaster, horror games are something I know I wouldn't have really known of or probably would have gotten into as quickly as I did without the Silent Hill movie introducing me to the Silent Hill franchise. So maybe I have an especially soft spot for the movie Silent Hill because of that, but I'd argue that at the end of the day, if the movie were to introduce just one person to the iconic franchise, that's a good thing. These are games that I probably wouldn't have known about until probably quite later in my life if I didn't watch this terrible movie adaptation. So I'm just saying, maybe that's a good enough reason for its existence. It can bring people into the Silent Hill franchise through, you know, a way that they probably wouldn't have expected to be brought in. Because I mean, despite all its flaws, I think it's pretty sick that a bad movie 
could introduce me and probably so many others to such a fucking cool franchise. The Silent Hill movie is not the world's best game to movie adaptation. It's not even close as far as I'm concerned with more recent TV shows considered as well. However, the movie definitely isn't as bad as it's made out to be, and that could just be me being delusional, but I think that the Silent Hill movie channels the main beats, themes, and feel of the Silent Hill game in a pretty good way despite its many flaws and differences. It's not immune to criticism, but I think that despite it all, it can still be quite the enjoyable movie. And going into the film, instead of expecting that 10 out of 10 game adaptation that we're actually starting to get now, consider it a reimagination which it fits more in definition with. You actually might enjoy it more and find it to be pretty good like I have. Because I mean, if a game in the Silent Hill franchise can do it and still be enjoyable, I truly think this movie with less changes can be the same thing. The movie Silent Hill can also be pretty good, an enjoyable experience, and above all, a great introduction to the Silent Hill games for people who may not have otherwise heard of them and all their glory. However, Unlike this movie, the second movie's a whole other coke-snorting lord shot of a fever dream, but I'll save that for another time. Until then, thank you all for watching this very long, very delusional, and very heavily my opinion-based video on why I like the Silent Hill movie. Feel free to roast me in the comments, however, as I said at the beginning, I am entitled to liking one bad movie as a treat. And until the next video, which I promise will not be me more than likely pissing off fans of a very, very well-loved franchise. Seriously, go use Yami, I promise I like the games. Just remember this. If the Silent Hill movie has one fan, I am that one. And if the Silent Hill movie has no fans, that means that I am most definitely 100% fucking dead.